make a little shout out to all of the, the shut-ins that are at home watching this morning. We hope you have a great day today. Um, scripture reading will be from Deuteronomy in chapter 21. Chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. If a man is found slain, lying in a field in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess, and it is not known who killed him, your elders and judges shall go out and measure the distance from the body to the neighboring towns. Then the elders of the town nearest the body shall take a heifer that has never been worked and has never worn a yoke and lead her down to the valley that has not been plowed or planted and where there is a flowing stream. There in the valley they are to break the heifer's neck. The priest, the sons of Levi, shall step forward, for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister and to pronounce blessings in the name of the Lord and to decide all cases of dispute and assault. Then all the elders of the town nearest the body shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley, and they shall declare, Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it done. Accept this atonement for your people, Israel, whom you have redeemed, O Lord, and do not hold your pe people guilty of the blood of an innocent man. And the bloodshed will be atoned for, so you will purge from yourselves the guilt of shedding innocent blood, since you have done what is right in the name of the Lord. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Phil. And thank you, Vince, for the introduction. Great job. I'm excited about this next week. Delta McGuire is coming. We're going to learn how to use our cell phones. <laughs> That's going to be great, isn't it? <laughs> so I noticed in class, I taught 416 this morning, and even though they have Bibles in the classroom, they all passed a cell phone to each other so that they could read the text that we were studying. Uh, somehow you can't, you know, those pages just don't work quite right. But uh, it, was, it was just interesting that that's what happened. Potluck next week. The Spanish are going to be in here with us. So, you know, you might be able to sing in Spanish as well. Uh, it's going to be a good time. There's not going to be an evening or connect groups next week. And so we want to encourage you to come be part of this. The Internet, the media, all of the things that are going on in our world are just tremendous. I mean, it is having such a huge impact on us. And as usual, we could react negatively and say everything against it, but then I just carried an iPad up here. So <laughs> it's kind of like confessing before you even announce the sin, you know. Uh, but I think it's the way in which we use it. It's the best way to be able to do it. And so he's going to talk about this and about a way in which we're able to look at how things work. We seem to assign how God feels about things. God likes me, obviously. Not so sure about you, but God likes me, and whatever I do is kind of okay with God, because God and I have this understanding. I don't know how many times I've heard statements like that, that God, he's okay with me, he knows me, he knows this, and so we want to assign his feelings about things, and he would understand this situation. I'm not always so sure that the people who do that realize who God is or what God says or about how he would assign things. And so today may be one of those things that we want to assign and say, well, he would be okay with this because what else could we do? But I think maybe we need to look at what God says about it. This is one that's heavy into Bible study, so get your Bible out. I know we'll have some up here, but... Uh, we want to talk about innocent blood today and about what that really means. So what that means is there's a lot of violence in the world. There's a lot of things that we see on TV. We'll talk about that next week. There's a lot of murder. There's a lot of things that are going on. And so that's really what we're talking about in the Bible. Did you know murder is in the Bible? I mean, the first two boys that are born, one of them kills the other. 
And from that point on, this concept of innocent blood is throughout Scripture. And so we've got a lot of Scriptures to cover because we're starting, you know, clear back there. But we'll skip ahead to where Deuteronomy is and look at this. If you look at the news, you're going to see a lot of violence. From January to June this year in Phoenix, there were 117 homicides. That is down from last year when there were 145 and has been going down each year. But that doesn't seem like an insignificant number. It seems like that's a lot of people to die, not just die, but to be killed. These are ruled homicides, 117 people in six months. The year's not over yet. Violence is one of the things that God sees in his world. It's one of the things that he's most upset about. We see it with Cain and Abel, and, and he says, your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And it kind of forms the whole concept that God sees this blood that each one of us have within us as being that life and being this part of, of who we are, and that that's something that's precious, and nobody's supposed to kill us. Nobody's supposed to take that, and we are not supposed to do it. The flood happens basically because of violence in the world. It says God could not stand the violence anymore. We may have thought it was because of something else. But when we practice that kind of violence, he says we are, we are doing something that is completely against God. So today... You may watch detective shows or police shows or things like that. Well, this is the Bible version of the detective show, Who Done It. The problem is there's been a murder committed. There has been innocent blood shed. The man was not guilty. And we don't know who did it. And so if you look at the passage, the first passage that we read talks about who did it. And the way you find out who did it is you measure who lives the closest. I mean, seriously, that's it. You measure who lives the closest. And if it isn't you, then you may need to do something. And that's why the sacrifice of the heifer, that's why all of these things are to prove I didn't do it. And so this one's more about who's innocent than who's guilty. And it isn't an investigation into who did it, it's an investigation into I didn't do it. And so that's what you see. I, what I want you to realize is God is serious about taking someone's life. Murder is not something that is just taken lightly. It is not something God is okay with. It is not something God condones in any case at any time. The price must be paid. But sometimes we didn't do it. Just because we live the closest to the body, we aren't the ones who did it. And so there's a sacrifice to prove the innocence in this case. This is God's law. This is what God set up. This is how he wanted it to happen. So who's guilty of that blood? And blood guilt was something that God understands and God holds people responsible for. Because he saw the life was in the blood. So if you found a dead body, no one's around, you measure the closest place. If you want to look at it a little bit bigger, you look at what they do. The elders wash their hands, the heifer's neck was broken, and they claim their innocence. We didn't see it, we don't know who did it, and we didn't do it. And so please accept this sacrifice and hold us as innocent in this man's blood. And that was it. It was set up so that they were not guilty of this. Because that's the way it was done. This is to keep them right with God. To keep them in a right relationship with God. And so you're able to see some things like that, that that may help us to understand how serious God was about this. We can think about how in olden times people got killed all the time. Well, in olden times, when people got killed all the time, God was watching. And God was very interested in who did the killing. And he held every single person guilty. And we may think it's better today, but realize that this goes a long way back. 
And so as you look at this, it's important to understand. Now, it was not only murder that you find blood guilt in. So in Leviticus chapter 20, I want you to realize there's a passage here that talks about this as well. He says, I want you to be holy with me. I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes. Do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And then verse 9, for anyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father and his mother. His blood is upon him. So there are some situations. I know, you just came up with a re- how to deal with children. No, I'm not sure this is a good way to deal with children. If it's gotten this far to where they're cursing their parents, then, okay, something should have been a long time before this. But anyone who curses his father or mother, he says... They're not guilty if they decide we cannot do this anymore and the child is killed. Really? That just, that doesn't seem right. In our day of tolerance, in our day of of putting up with things and putting up with everything, we think that, well, that just can't be right. How can God ever possibly say that? But he does. He says, because I will not put up with insubordination. I will not put up with a child who is so disrespectful to his parents that he would actually curse them. He says, we're better off without him. And God is serious about some things. And then he goes on from there to talk about blood guilt that is assigned with several sins. And we don't have the time to do them all this morning. But the first one in verse 9 is about cursing father and mother. He says he'll be put to death. If anyone is caught in adultery, innocent blood, both of them are killed. If anyone is a homosexual and sleeps with and is caught in the act of sleeping with, those people are killed. If anyone is caught with incest with a sister or a daughter-in-law, they're banished, they're childless. If anyone is a fortune teller or a spiritual medium, they are killed by stoning. And there is no sacrifice for any of these. There isn't something where you go in and you're able to say, well, let's offer a sacrifice for this. And what he's trying to say is they're guilty of their own blood because they did it to themselves. And that's really what he's trying to get across. When you sin, the penalty of death, the blood is on them. It's their own blood. Uh, And that's what he's trying to say with this whole thing. You're justified because they are guilty of their own blood. Leviticus 20, I know, read it later. However, what happens if somebody died and it was an accident? Not your fault. Somehow something happened and they died and it's not your fault. Well, there's another provision that covers that as well. And so in Deuteronomy 19, if you'll go with me there. He sets up cities of refuge. Start in verse 4, he says, This is the provision for the manslayer who by fleeing there may save his life. If anyone kills his neighbor unintentionally without having hated him in the past, as when someone goes into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood, And his hand swings an axe to cut down a tree, and the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies. He may flee to one of the cities and live, lest the avenger of blood in hot pursuit, in hot anger, pursue the manslayer and overtake him because the way is long and strike him fatally. Though the man did not deserve to die since he had not hated his neighbor in the past, therefore I command you, you shall set apart three cities." And so these were called cities of refuge. And so he even gives you the scenario. You're chopping down a tree, the axe head flies off, hits somebody, and he says, well, not your fault, it's just an accident. However, the thing you have to remember with this, it's eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and somebody is coming. Somebody is coming. You know, it's either God who's coming or a relative who is coming. And so you better drop the axe handle and run. Because they have the right and the responsibility to come and to exact justice at that moment. And if they're close at hand, 
they can come and take your life because you killed someone that was related to them. I know, it seems so strange, doesn't it? How can God be serious about all of this? But he is. He says, I want you to know what sin's like, and I want you to know what happens, and even if it's an accident, I set up a city where you could run until the trial is over. Now, once the trial is over, then whatever happens, happens. If they find you guilty, then you're still put to death because it's death for de death, life for life, tooth for tooth, eye for eye. But if they find you innocent, then you can leave the city. And so there were three cities that God set up. I want you to measure the distance and put in three cities. And then there's three extra cities that you're going to need just so that people are able to go there. So the New Testament seems to be different than this, just so you'll know. In the New Testament, God says, I will be the avenger. He doesn't say it's eye for eye. He doesn't say it's tooth for tooth. We are not to take revenge. Look at the end of Romans 12 when we are wronged. We are not the one who does this. God says, I will be the one who takes all revenge. And so it has changed in the Bible. There is something that is different in this. But as you look at verses 9 and 10 and all this, it's provided that you are careful to keep this commandment which I command you today by loving the Lord your God and by walking ever in his ways. Then you shall add three other cities to these three, lest innocent blood be shed in your land upon the Lord your God, giving you for an inheritance. So the guilt of bloodshed be upon you. And so he's talking about this whole thing. He says, I don't want innocent blood to be shed anywhere. And especially not if it's just because you're the avenger and you didn't know the guy did it by accident. You just know my brother's dead. And so you've come to exact vengeance. He says, I don't want to have blood guilt anywhere. If he hates his neighbor, if he's found guilty, then it's eye for eye, tooth for tooth. God hates this. We want to assign a lot of other things God hates, but this is one other thing God hates. Proverbs 6, 17, God hates people who will take someone else's life. Do not shed innocent blood. The Old Testament is full of it. God's punishment is full of it. And we can see that as we look at the way things are carried out and as some of the sacrifices are carried out. But you realize there are also some things that there is no sacrifice for. And murder is one of those. I mean, the punishment is the punishment and you're going to be killed unless you can run away. It would kind of deter murder a little bit, make you think twice because there's somebody else who's coming after you. And if they can't find you, God can. And that does seem to be the situation. So let's look at one specific murder today. This one's in the New Testament, and this one you're very familiar with. This is the murder of Jesus. So in Matthew 27, look at what happened as Jesus is about to be betrayed. It says, when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders and the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and they led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. And when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And by throwing down the pieces into the temple, he departed and he went and he hanged himself. And the chief priest taking the pieces of silver said, it's not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So they took counsel and brought them with them and bought, and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. So now maybe this passage makes a little bit more sense. Because you're always thinking, well, what happened here? Why did this happen? Why did he hang himself? Why, you know, why is he upset about this? No, this was a very serious thing. And when he comes, he says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And that is everything we've looked at so far. That's the passage in Deuteronomy. That's what he knows. I am the guy 
who has committed this murder. I am the guy who brought this. I'm sitting here with the silver. He brings the silver back. But unfortunately, the price for betraying innocent blood is not silver. It's death. And so Judas, when he goes to hang himself, hangs himself before someone else comes to do it. Because someone else is always coming. There will not be a time where there is a murder and no one else comes. Because there is always someone else coming. Does that put a little more perspective on the situation Judas is in? Where he realizes, I am the one who has betrayed innocent blood. I am the one who's done all of this. And so that was his sin. He couldn't find a way out. And so he hangs himself. Because after all, there is no sacrifice for betraying innocent blood. He knows the penalty. He knows what it's like. Well, then they can't accept blood money back. And I've always thought, well, blood money. I mean, really, is there blood on the money? There's no blood on the money. You just wash it. It's fine. But no, that's really not the case. Because this is a statute that's been set up by God. And so maybe today you understand this passage a little bit better. No, they can't accept it back. This is blood money. And it is tainted. And it is guilty. And so they buy a field in which to bury him. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Their response is not appropriate. What's that to us? See to that yourself. It doesn't really matter, right? No, it does really matter. If they were really teachers of the law, they would have understood this. But they don't. And so they are not going to carry it out because it was accomplishing what they wanted it to accomplish. If you look further into verse 15, it says, The feast of the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who was called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. And now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And they said to him, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. It's crazy. He thinks Jesus is innocent, but he can't really release him. So he's got this one way they were used to releasing one prisoner, and usually the one they thought was innocent. So we've got two, one we know is guilty, one we know is innocent. So why can't we just release the one that's innocent? But no, they're not going to have that. They're going to say, well, release Barabbas. Well, it's just a custom, it's not a law. And what do I do with Jesus? Well, you crucify him. You see, they're calling for innocent blood. That's really what it's all about, isn't it? What shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? Let him be crucified. And it's the shout for innocent blood. They don't care if it's right. They don't care what's going on. Yes, they understand the Old Testament. Yes, they understand what they're asking for. Pilate tries to help with this whole situation in the next couple of verses. So... Then Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning. So he took water and he washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. And the people answered, His blood be upon us and on our children. And released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. 
Pilate can't do anything with the crowd. It takes on a little bit more meaning when you look at it in the context of what Deuteronomy had to say. He still has the power to do what he wants, but with that kind of crowd. And so he washes his hands. Hand washing was never going to get him free from the blood. But the people take the responsibility for it. Do they realize what they're saying? Let his blood be upon us and on our children. We claim innocent blood. They deserve death. There is an avenger. And there will be a sacrifice very soon. And as Jesus is taken out and Jesus is nailed to a cross, it's finally carried out. It's finally at that time where here is the case. They have come to the point where they are guilty of innocent blood because Jesus dies on that cross. And while they are not directly maybe the ones who drove the nails because Romans drove the nails, they are at least complicit in his death. And if betrayal is guilty of innocent blood, then the shouting for his crucifixion and the trial makes them guilty as well of innocent blood. And they have killed an innocent man and they realize the sacrifice is their own life. That's what justice demands. That's what God's law is. But we didn't do it. And we're not guilty. But there is a sacrifice. And he died for us. And that's why it is so significant when you get to Peter's sermon. As Peter begins to talk. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You are guilty of innocent blood. And what's the penalty? The penalty is take the crowd that is watching Peter and kill them all. Every single person who shouted, crucify. Every single person who betrayed. Every single person who brought him. Every single person who was involved and complicit in his death. And that's why it is such a huge shock when the people ask, what do we do? And Peter said, repent. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. How can that be? That's amazing. That's impossible. But innocent blood has been shed for their sin. And he says, I want you to save yourselves from this perverse generation. And they didn't hang themselves. Because they know what that's, that's what should be coming. And for the first time, there is a sacrifice for innocent blood. For the first time, there is a sacrifice for cursing your father and mother. For the first time, there is a sacrifice for adultery. For the first time, there is a sacrifice for incest. There is a sacrifice for homosexuality. There is a sacrifice for sorcery. There is a sacrifice for every single sin that anyone could ever commit. And as you think about the implications of that, it is huge. It is world-changing that there had never been a sacrifice for any of those things. And now the people who are standing listening to their judgment call are hearing that 
God accepts you. God loves you. God has grace for you. It's amazing if we could ever just get this part today, that we are guilty, but his forgiveness is by innocent blood. And it's not because we are guilty of his murder, but we did enough other things, right? And that's kind of why we're here today, is that he died for me. And Jesus now forgives all sins. And yes, I know about, you know, the Holy Spirit and about, don't blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, but every other sin Jesus forgives. In John 1, 7, he cleanses us from all sin. In Romans 5, 9, we have been justified by his blood, by innocent blood that God would allow us, because of our faith, to enter his grace. What an amazing thing it is that God has done. And for all of history, they never understood this. But to get to the point where you sit today, we have such good news for people that we can be free because innocent blood was shed. And it's based on the grace of God. And the question is, what do you do now? A lot of people decide, no, I'm going to keep my guilt. I don't want the blood of Jesus. I don't want to follow him. I don't want to be with him. I'll keep all my own guilt. And the avenger is coming, by the way. But we have the chance to be free. We have the chance to be forgiven. And we know God is able to do this because Jesus has offered himself. Innocent blood that was given from a man who had never sinned for us. And all the things that we know about us to be free in him. What a tremendous grace it is that God gives. Would you respond to that today? Do you have that today? Can we help you find that today? Let's Stand and sing about this.